Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Greetings of peace and may the mercy of God be upon you. For giving me this opportunity to welcome everybody on their behalf and also to Sister Zarina, who has worked extensively and tirelessly to make connections between the MCC community and the Interfaith Internet Connect community and also with the Hub. And I will end with just a short story of where I am coming from because for me, Interfaith work is really something, I'm a product of interfaith work. My father was a Muslim from Jordan and my mother was a Catholic from Mississippi. Ask me how that happened. That's a story for another day. But basically she was on a Cesar Chavez picket line. He was a master's student studying in Jackson, Mississippi. It was the lettuce and grape, lettuce bowl and, and, and grape strike of the early mid-70s. He saw her protesting, asked her what it was about, and here I am today. <laughs> but inter so for that reason, interfaith work is very dear to my heart because I'm a product of what happens when two people come together of different faiths and show the world that even in our differences we can find commonalities, and that's what I hope in works like this. And so I'd like to just read a prayer that I thought of because one of the things is I really like to seek hope in the stories of the prophets. And so I started thinking about the prophets that God has sent mankind. And so I said, God, you gave us hope when, 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 remember, when we remember the covenant of the Mithah, when you called out to the souls of humanity gathered on that original plane and you asked, am I not your Lord? And we all as humanity responded by saying, Beda, yes, indeed, you are our Lord. You gave us hope when you created our father Adam, the first human being, and when the angels asked you, will you create ones who will shed blood and spread mischief in the earth? And you said, I know what you do not know. And by that you gave us hope by reminding us that just as there is a potential for evil in mankind, there is also the potential for great hope. And you gave us hope when you chose to purify the world through the flood by carrying Noah, and then by carrying Noah and the believers on the ark. And we remember that hope every time we see your promise in the form of a rainbow in the heavens, an unstrung bow. And when the believers, the children of Israel, lived under oppression of one of the mightiest regimes on earth, you gave the believers hope, not in the form of a mighty army or brute force, but in an infant boy who was cast into the river Nile by his mother who had hope in you. You gave us hope when you sent the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, peace be upon him, alayhi salam, to remind humankind of who they are, and you gave us hope when you promised us that he will return, and for his return we await hopefully. And you gave us hope when you sent, sent the light of prophethood with Muhammad وسلم, peace and blessings upon him, who recited your word in the Quran and teaching us that hope and fear are like two wings of a bird that we must balance to fly into your infinite mercy. Then, as Fadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, the famous Andalusian scholar, said, the verse which gives us the most hope in the Quran is, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْلَقُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say, O my servants who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins Indeed, it is he who is the forgiving, the merciful. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Pastor Kim Reisdorf. And I want to first give you just a brief overview of our worship service this evening. Thank you. You're going to hear a series of readings, each from a different tradition, all exploring our theme of hope. And in your bulletin, the author of each is identified next to the passage they wrote, and the readers and their respective faith communities are listed on the last page of your worship bulletin. These readings were intentionally chosen to deepen our awareness of hope as a spiritual practice, something that people of faith do every day. When we live with hope, we live with power, the power to bring justice, compassion, mercy, and peace to our world. We invite you to hear each selection as a message from the higher power 
that brings you here today. May we each pay attention and be alert to a word, a phrase, an insight that grabs us and carry it with us out into the world so that together we live with hope and together we transform the world. And now let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship by praying together the opening prayer, which is printed in your bulletin. Your lines are in italics. For the days since last we met and shared our common bond of humanity, we thank you, God. For the heavens which declare your glory and for the earth which shows your handiwork, we thank you, God. For our daily food and drink, our home and families and our friends, we thank you, God. For the concern of those who call us to be good stewards of the earth, we thank you, God. For minds to think, hearts to love, and hands to serve, we thank you, God. For your servants in ages past who heard your word and proclaimed your sovereignty, we thank you, God. For the brave and courageous and all valiant seekers of truth, liberty, and justice, we thank you, God. For this night and your spirit, which binds us together in a moment of worship, we thank you, God. For your blessing, which lifts us from brokenness to wholeness, from despair to hope, from darkness to light, and from fear to trust, we thank you, God. Amen and amen.
tonight that by Chieko Okazaki, former leader of the Women's Relief Society of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, from a sermon on hope she delivered shortly after the death of her husband. Hope is a virtue for all seasons and all adversities. What is the opposite of hope? Despair, of course. But despair comes when we feel powerless to influence events and when the sources of meaning in our life disappear. Despair is a kind of disorientation so profound that we lose contact with the sources of life itself. I am not a very good gardener, but I recently noticed that a carelessly placed brick had squashed a pansy flat. Part of the pansy was still peeking out from under the edge of the brick, and over the next few weeks, that pansy put its energies into creeping sideways around the edge of the brick, pushing its short shoots into the air and sunlight and blossoming in its friendly purple and gold. When I moved the brick, the pansy's stem was crooked, but oh, its flower was as glorious as those next to it. This pansy chose life. It experienced adversity, but it chose life. It experienced crippling, but it chose life. It could not have been blamed or faulted for giving up under the brick, but it chose life. The sources of hope are the sources of life itself. That's why hope persists, even when experience, reason, and knowledge all say there is no reason to hope. Hope does not calculate odds. It is a double-sided virtue. It is prepared for either sunny or stormy weather. To choose hope is to choose life. To choose hope is to choose love. But because we are mortal, death is entangled with life. We can choose to feed the darkness and death in our lives, or we can choose to feed the brightness of hope in our lives. We can worry, we can deny the light, we can cooperate in the killing of our spirits and the strengthening of our hopes until meaninglessness and despair overcome us. Or we can choose to ally ourselves with God, with his hope, with the inexhaustible and irrepressible life that is his. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Here, herein lies our hope. Alicia, and today I'll be reading The Call of Love by Rumi. At every instant, from every side, resounds the call of love. We're going to sky. Who wants to come with us? We've gone to heaven. We've been the friends of angels. And now we will go back there, for there is our country. And now we will go back there. We are higher than heaven, more noble than angels. Why not go beyond them? Our goal is a supreme majesty. What has the fine pearl to do with the world of dust? Why have you come down here? Take your baggage back. What is this place? Luck is with us. To us is a sacrifice. Like the birds of the sea, men come from the ocean, the ocean of the soul. Like birds of the sea, men come from the ocean, the ocean of the soul. How can this bird, born from the sea, make his dwelling here? No, we are the pearls from the bosom of the sea. It is there that we dwell. Otherwise, how could, how could the wave succeed to the wave that comes from the soul? The wave named, Am I Not Your Lord, has come. It has broken the vessel of, of the body. And when the vessel is broken, the vision comes back and the union with him. Prayer of St. Francis is familiar to most of us, I imagine, so I invite you to join with us as we pray this prayer together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, 
let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. soul. Not so much to be understood as to understand. Not so much to be loved as to love. For it is the giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we awake to the eternal life. I am Stephen Furr, the interim minister at the Unitarian Universal Church in Livermore. Unitarian Universalism derives from the first parish churches, from the establishment churches in colonial New England, and also from the more working class Universalist churches. Universalists were not so much uh, noted for what they believed in, but what they believed, they didn't believe. They didn't believe in hell. And there was some debate as to the exact technic, techniques of it all, but that ultimately they all believe that we would all be reabsorbed into God on the final days of judgment. So that was not only do we have hope in our own salvation, but hope that ultimately everyone would be saved. And maybe universalists, early ecumenists, and interfaith believers that everyone of all faiths and places would be saved. Among the most celebrated early, early Universalists was the Reverend John Murray, Army Chaplain to General George Washington in the American Revolution, and the founding pastor of the Independent Christian Church in Gloucester, Massachusetts. He wrote, God's grace extends and will continue to expand, extend to the whole family of humanity. He will have compassion on the ignorant and on those who reside in faraway places. He is and ever will be loving unto every person and his mercy over all of his works. I am right happy in an opportunity of thus rendering a reason for the hope which is in me. I do assure you my hope does not make me ashamed, for I know it is a hope full of immortality. I know that God can be faithful and just in forgiving our sins, and I once more declare, I do believe that God will annihilate sin and save the sinner. His promise, his oath, compel me to believe his sacred word. May I always give him credit as I will yield to no created being. But my God will lead us all unto truth, that we may be all taught of God, and that knowing God, we may love God. For we cannot know God and not love him. And we cannot love God whom we have not seen without loving our brother whom we have seen. I am grateful for the patience you have exercised toward me. And I close by devoutly wishing that God may shed it abroad his love in our hearts. Good evening. I am Dr. Ram Rao. I was a professor of neuroscience, and now I am the temple manager at the Shiva Vishnu Temple in Livermore. I am representing the Hindu community and the temple to talk to you about hope. So we are all gathered here to discuss about hope, and notice that hope is weakening at an alarming rate from the human psyche. People are losing hope in almost everything worthwhile. And with hope extinguished from the lamp of life, emotional forces including fear, worry, anger, anxiety, rage, depression, all of this have encapsulated every aspect, every fiber of mankind like that which we have never seen before. With all hopes lost, 
we had chosen though unconsciously to be like machines on an autopilot mode of frenzied dispositions. In contrast though, spontaneity, joy, creativity, bliss, contentment belongs to us, the conscious beings, and not to machines. So the need of the day is to bring these qualities in us that in turn will cultivate the quality of hope. We hope that we will soon be blissfully aware of our true nature as spirits and recognize that this entire world of living and non-living beings is nothing but a manifestation of that one reality. And in Sanskrit we call that Vasudeva Kutumbakam. This entire world is one family that lives magnanimously. This is hope, and this hope lies the fundamental essence of peace. We hope that there is peace from our own internal conflicts. It's called Adhyatmika in Sanskrit. We hope that there is peace from natural disturbances. It's called Adhipautika in Sanskrit. And we hope that there is peace from unexplained forces. We call that Adhidaivika in Sanskrit. This same feeling of hope radiates onwards to include all manifestations. It encourages cooperation, compassion, and living in harmony, not only among other humans, but with nature as well. And this is a message of hope in this form of living. This is the verse that's there in your books. Asotoma sadgamaya, we hope to see truth from ignorance. Tamasoma Jyotir Kamaya, we hope to see the light in me that dispels the darkness. Mrityorma Amrutam Kamaya, we hope to see ourselves as an immortal divine entities. Om Jo Santiti, hope this peace radiates in the whole sky. Antariksham Shantiti, hope this peace radiates in the vast ethereal space everywhere. Prithvi Shanti, hope that this peace reigns all over the earth. Apaha Shanti, hope this peace reigns in the waters. Aushadha Shanti, Vanaspata Shanti, hope this peace exists in all the herbs, the trees, the plants, and the flowers. Shanti, Vishwedeva, hope this peace flows over the entire universe. Shanti Brahma, may peace be the supreme being. Shanti Sharvam, Shanti Reva Shanti, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Hope this always exists in all peace and peace alone. Om peace and peace and peace to us in all beings. join me in reading together this beautiful poem by Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing that matters and purchase in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweet as the gale is heard and slow as the storm that could have the little bird that has so many more. I've heard it in the chillest I find hope in the darkest of days and focus in the brightest. I do not judge the universe. A small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. 
Even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. The first will be Psalm 27, verses 1 and 13, and it reads as such. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord 
in the land of the living. The second passage, passage of scripture I will be reading will be Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3a, and verses 18 and 19. And it reads as such. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I have read for you Psalm 27, 1 and 13, Isaiah 43, 1 through 3a, and verses 18 through 19. May God have a blessing to the readers, hearers, and the doers of his holy word. In the name of the one who goes by many names, Almighty God, Allah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, and Ultimate Truth. It is a joy to be here, to be together in this diverse community of people of different faiths and different backgrounds, to celebrate Thanksgiving and to commit to cultivating together as a community hope, both for our individual lives and for the world. I went to Santa Rosa last month. I was invited to be on an interfaith pastoral care team to accompany families as they went back to see their property that had been burned to devastation. We were paired and two of us would go to a neighborhood and park and then just walk around and wait and see if anybody came back. It was the first and second day of the time when the people could return to their former homes. And there was really nothing recognizable in this neighborhood. It was rubble and ashes. The walls weren't even there to indicate exactly where the houses had been. Everything was leveled to foundations. You might see a brick here and there, or a broken chimney, or a step, or a flower pot, or a dish. But otherwise, it was gray and destroyed. We went up to people as they arrived in their cars and just introduced ourselves and said, well, we were there if you'd like to talk. And some people did. And of course there were tears and there were stories of loss and despair, but the stories that remain with me are stories of hope. One was the first family we visited with. There was a girl, I'll call her Jenny. She was eight years old and she had returned with her grandparents to their home. They had been there the day before, but they hadn't brought the granddaughter until this next day and Jenny wanted to be there with them because her parents were divorced and she spent a lot of time with her grandparents and she even had a room in their house where she spent many nights. And when Jenny arrived, she didn't want to get out of the car. She was crying and she covered her face because she didn't want to look and see what there was to see there. <laughs> and so the grandmother had just met me and she said, well, this woman's name is Heather and uh, she'd be happy to talk to you, Jenny. And so Jenny and I crossed the street and we sat on the opposite curb and we looked out into the valley. You could still see green in that direction. And we talked for a while and she cried and she told me that there wouldn't be the toys that she had known she had and loved in her grandparents' house. They wouldn't be there anymore for her. And she was worried about her grandparents that they wouldn't be able to afford another place to live, and what would happen to them, and where would they go? 
and after a while she asked all the questions she could think of. And then she remembered that her grandmother, the day before, had picked up a piece of glass that was melted with many colors in it and then hardened. And she told Jenny that she would make a piece of jewelry for her out of that glass. And Jenny was pleased about that. And then she said, oh, and my grandma found my handprint that I made in kindergarten and I gave to my grandmother as a gift. She found it and she was so happy that she had it. And I'm happy too. And I said, oh, you really love your grandmother and your grandmother really loves you, doesn't she? And she said, yes, and that hasn't changed even with the fire. <laughs> Such a simple affirmation of love and what matters. And then we walked around what would be a block and came upon a couple. They appeared to be taking a break at their car and they were just leaning against the car and standing there with nothing to say really until we came up and we offered to talk if they'd like to, to tell us their story of what had happened. And the man was very eager to tell. He had a list ready in his mind to tell me all the things that he had done. He'd applied to his insurance, he had applied to FEMA, he found a place to live, he started to get furniture and blah, 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 blah. And then there was a break. And then I looked at his wife next to him who was silent and I said, and how are you feeling? And she said, look around you. All of my neighbors have lost everything. I feel so bad for them. And I work at the hospital. I'm so glad I have a job. I can work at the hospital and help people. I can help the people who are hurt in the fire and I can help the people who have no homes anymore. And it's something to do that feels like hope. What an affirmation of care. Caring about other people, even when you've lost everything of your own. Love and care are really what matter. I know you've been hearing about these stories of people you know in California who've suffered from the fires, and we're all connected. We all know someone who knows someone. We've all heard stories together one minister in Santa Rosa, a Fijian man, was awakened in the middle of that night when the fire was coming, not by a neighbor, but by his brother in Fiji, who called him. Because he saw on the internet that the neighborhoods were evacuating in Santa Rosa, and he wanted to be sure his brother was okay. We are connected in our communities, and we are connected around the world. The tragedies that have befallen our world this fall have been monumental. Monumental. Hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. We all know someone who knows someone who suffered and has been caught in those storms. And the people in poverty in those areas, for example, in Puerto Rico, where there still is no power, we have to care about them. We have to love them. And perhaps you know someone outside of Mexico City, someone who was hurt in that terrible earthquake that hit on September 19, killing more than 200 people. Or maybe you are from South Sudan, or know people from there where flooding has displaced 11,000 people. Or you know people in Somalia where hundreds of people have been killed by terrorists. Some of these stories just eclipse the previous stories. You know the Las Vegas shooting that killed 59 and injured hundreds on October 1st, and then the shooting in Texas, and then in California? Terrorist attacks, refugees on the run. We are fatigued by tragedy. We almost become numb, and we cannot feel it anymore because it's almost normal to read these stories in the news and to see the scenes on television. But we must care. We must love. For this is what makes us human. A book published this year called A Hope More Powerful Than the Sea. 
is a true story of a refugee. I really love reading these stories because it helps me understand a little bit of what people are experiencing. This is a story that takes place in the town of Dara, Syria, and the woman is named Doa. It was Mother's Day, March 21st, 2011, and Doa's family wanted to visit her grandmother's grave and honor her and read the first chapter of the Quran together and then have a meal together as a family. But protesters were marching in demonstrations through the town and people were lighting fires. Violence swept through the city streets and the smell of smoke was everywhere. There was shooting and people were dropping dead on the street. They couldn't go to the cemetery. They couldn't get there. By April, the city was under siege. The family went into hiding and Noah's father lost his shop in the bombs. Doa became sick and she needed to go to the doctor. She was accosted by soldiers on her way to the doctor and barely made it home from the pharmacy back safely to her family. Doa didn't want to abandon the revolution that she believed in. She said that leaving Syria would be like taking her soul away from her, but she had no other option but to leave. By 2016, Syrians would become the largest displaced population in the world. Five million Syrians were forced to flee across borders. 6.5 million were internally displaced. Dua and her fiance, Bassam, managed to flee to the Mediterranean, but the boat that they boarded was small and the water was rough and Bassam was lost at sea. The author writes, Doa was adrift in the center of a hostile sea that had just swallowed the man she loved. She was so cold she couldn't feel her feet and so thirsty her tongue had swollen in her mouth. She grabbed at two infants who were floating in the water beside her. They had become separated from their parents. Doa was so overcome with grief that if it had not been for those two tiny infant girls, she wanted to save, she would have allowed the sea to consume her. She made it to Crete and then to Sweden. It was her belief in God and in life itself that saved her. She had a hope more powerful than the sea. It's hard to imagine such a flight really hard for me to imagine. I went two weeks ago to Oakland where Doctors Without Borders had a simulation where we could experience a little bit more what it would be like to be a refugee. It was called Forced From Home. It was outdoors and volunteers escorted groups of people around from one station to the other in tents and on the pavement to see what it was like. I was told I was to be a refugee from Syria and out of 25 cards, I had to pick five cards. Quickly, I only had a couple seconds to do it. Five, the five things that I wanted to take with me as I was in flight. Well, I picked a passport and water, money, a blanket, and a cell phone. But then I had to give them up as they went along because everything cost something and I had to give up what I had. I got into a rubber raft and was told that 40 more people were were to climb in with me, and that it would cost $5,000 to make a crossing from Turkey to Greece, and that I would have to buy a life jacket, but it might be a false one. And if it was a cheap one, it would soak up water, and it wouldn't let, let me float. So then I would die at sea. My guide from the exhibit was a nurse from Doctors Without Borders by the name of Jessica. Jessica is from Indiana. 75% so of the time, she works out of the country with Doctors Without Borders, and 25% of the time, she lives in Indiana where she tries to make money so that she can live and keep an apartment. Well, on November 30th, Jessica is going to Bangladesh. Death camps. He developed a theory and a practice called logotherapy. The premise is that when we find meaning in life through work, 
in relationships of love or midst suffering. We can go on in hope. And we can help others do the same. Franco's work has helped many, many people come to the point where they can overcome the reality of tragedy and sadness by grieving the loss and then deciding to live beyond the grip of that loss. When we find a purpose, we can live with hope. The hope is grounded in the struggle itself. My parents accompanied Frankel when he went back for the first time to one of the concentration camps where he had been imprisoned. They saw him put his hands in the dust and they saw him weep. He faced the reality of the horror and he grieved for his loved ones and for all six million Jews who died in the Holocaust. I knew Frankel as a man who had a great heart and a great sense of humor. He came to our home in Vienna and he laughed and he shared evenings with my family. He was a survivor of tragedy who was able to help others find in their lives a reason to live with hope. We come together today because in spite of everything that our world faces, we want to work together for good, don't we? We do. We want to work together for good. Our hope challenges us not just to live for ourselves, but also to share our resources, to listen to one another's stories, and to figure out together how we can possibly heal the world. It requires a creative act to imagine a better world and work for it. We need to think like artists, maybe. Imagine that blank canvas and what we could put on it. How can hope lead us into something new? God says in Isaiah, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make the way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Howard Thurman was a great writer, a black Christian theologian who influenced Martin Luther King Jr. Howard Thurman wrote about how in love and care, we walk together through all life's tragedies. These are his words. I share with you the agony of your grief, the anguish of your heart finds echo in my own. I know I cannot enter all you feel nor bear with you the burden of your pain. I can, but offer what my love does give the strength of caring, the warmth of one who seeks to understand the silent, storm-swept barrenness of so great a loss. This I do in quiet ways, that on your lonely path, you may not walk alone. We must be like the psalmist. We need to Find the energy, find the hope of the psalmist who says, I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. For we live together in community and in community with God walking beside us. We never walk alone. This is the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is our hope. It empowers us to be human, which is to love and care. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Those who don't have family to turn to for help can always find support at Open Heart Kitchen. People think that soup kitchens are just for the homeless, but that's not the case. Our, we're, our, the families that we serve are often choosing between food or utilities, food or medicine, and food or shelter. We give them a secure source of nutrition so they can use what little resources they have left to break the cycle of poverty. With something as simple as a meal, we give them hope. Because when you're hungry, nothing else matters. Food is one of the most basic necessities and no one should go without nutrition. And it all comes down to access. It's our biggest challenge. For working families, it's too hard to come home from work, pack up the kids, and haul them across town for meal sites. So we offer them food to go. So mom or dad can come by on the way home from work, get some food and take it home to their kids. And what I like about that is the kids don't need to know where the food came from. As far as they're concerned, it came from a restaurant. We serve the community through three meal programs. Our hot meal program is now open seven days a week. This has been a goal of Open Heart Kitchens for many years now. We recognize that hunger doesn't end over the weekends. Now our community has access to a meal every day. We have five locations, two in Livermore, two in Pleasanton, and one in Dublin. Our Children's Weekend Bag Lunch Program benefits kids who are on the free and reduced school lunch program during the week, but don't necessarily have a secure source of nutrition over the weekend. Every Thursday, we gather a large group of volunteers together. They assemble 2,500 bag lunches, and we deliver them to 22 schools. The kids take the lunches home so they have something to eat over the weekend. We also have four sites that provide meals five days a week exclusively to seniors. The meals are designed to meet the special dietary needs of seniors, and we serve the meals in a congregate setting. The sites have a restaurant feel to them, so the seniors come in and our staff and our volunteers try to make them feel special because they're getting out of the house that day. It's as simple as $3 a meal. It's our average meal cost across all of our programs. In 2016, we served over 345,000 meals. We have a very small staff and a volunteer workforce of over 375 volunteers every week. Our volunteer family is the heart of our organization. Some come in every day, others once a week, others once a month, but they all make a difference and we're always looking for new volunteers to join our team. I want to thank the partners in the faith community that are here today. Uh, we couldn't do what we do without you. And thank you for making a difference in the lives of our neighbors and me and giving them hope.
Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Marcia Belchison, Leadership Coordinator of Interfaith Interconnect. And we are so pleased to have each of you here today at our Thanksgiving service. Our mission at Interfaith Interconnect is to enrich, inform, and educate ourselves and others about the great diversity of faiths and cultures in our valley. And that's just what we're doing today. We currently have about 20 member faith groups representing several Christian congregations, as well as Baha'i, Hindu, Jewish, Jain, Muslim, Scientology, Sikh, and Unitarian Universalist. We welcome all, whether part of a faith group or not. In addition to our annual Thanksgiving service and annual potluck peace picnic in recognition of U UN Day of Peace, Interfaith Interconnect also organizes occasional events on various topics. We also hold a monthly religion chat the second Wednesday of each month except December, where two individuals are able to respond to a question about how their faith views a particular topic. And then afterwards, people meet in small groups to discuss. Our January religion chat is at the Hindu Community Center in Livermore, and we have someone of Hindu faith and a Muslim woman who will be presenting that day. So we have more information about Interfaith and Interconnect outside. Um, we hope you'll stop by the reception right next door after the service and talk with someone you've not met before. Thank you again for your presence today.
Dear ones, we've spent this evening in worship in the theme of hope. Not a temporary or fleeting hope that depends on circumstances, but the abiding hope. The knowledge that a goodness more powerful than all realities lies just beyond the veil. And so let us conclude with a prayer for that hope. Oh God, we pray that you would give us your glasses. Give us glasses through which we can see in strife, unripe peace. In destruction, fields fertile for growth of that which was never there before. And in division and darkness, unripe joy. And may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Spirit. Amen. Amen.